our next speaker comes uh, just arrived in Lyon this morning. Thank you very very much, Baptiste, for uh, for accepting the uh, to present today this morning. And it will be our last presentation in psychoacoustics, and then we'll move to another topic. And Baptiste will talk to us about uh, the investigation of auditory salience. Okay, thank you, Baptiste. Welcome, Baptiste, on the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here and for the organization. Um, so, I'm glad to present the work I've done so far at Yerkam Institute, um, uh, where I try to investigate auditory saliency. So, I'm working at the sound design and perception team there, uh, and this work is co directed by Catherine Marquis Favre from the LTDS. Uh, this work is funded by the French Ministry of Ecological Transition, for whom I work. So they granted me uh, the fundings for this project. So what do we, what do we speak about when we are talking about um, uh, auditory salience? So first, uh, we are talking about attention. In fact, in daily life, we are constantly bombarded with stimuli, and we have to set uh, a filter to process, uh, to, to select the information uh, we, we will be able to process. And in psychology, uh, this filter is called attention. And science is the bottom-up component of uh, this filter. In fact, uh, it is the ability uh, of a stimulus to capture a subject's attention independently of his or her will. And uh, the question we'd like to address in this thesis is uh, what acoustic parameters uh, must be manipulated to make a sound salient, and how. And then uh, we'll try to make the link uh, between salience and uh, annoyance. So the, the approach taken uh, until there was first to conduct a study on controlled stimuli, so a psychoacoustics uh, approach, and then uh, to try to study the extension of uh, the results we got to environmental sound scenes and study on these scenes the link with uh, annoyance. So uh, I will present you the this psychoacoustic approach. Uh, in fact, uh, there, were, there were two parts. So first, I, first I had to design a paradigm to 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 point out an effect, which is called the attentional capture effect, that I will present to you just uh, in the following part. Uh, so we adapted it from the vision, and uh, we tried to so make the adaptation between uh, vision and auditory modality. And uh, thanks to this paradigm, then we'll be able to study the influence of different acoustic properties of timber on salience. And we decided to make it at equal loudness. So the main idea is to, to understand what we have to change in the timber of a sound to make it salient without making it sound louder uh, for people. So first, I'd like to present this paradigm in vision uh, so that you better understand it. Uh, so this example comes from a study by Thieves in 1982. Um, so different geometric shapes containing bars will be presented to you, and you will just have to answer this, que this question. Uh, is the bar inside a circle horizontal or vertical? So if you are ready, let's go for the first trial. So here the circle was on the left, and the bar inside it was horizontal. Let's make another one. This time the circle was up there, and the bar was vertical. And next trial. So this time the circle was on the left and the bar was horizontal. And you surely have noticed it. And you may have noticed it even before the circle, but one of the squares is red. And this is precisely the presence of this square uh, that we'd like to study and how it implies longer response times and more error rates uh, when you have to answer this question. So uh, all the work so far uh, was about understanding how uh, 
the response times and the error rates in both conditions are different. And if we show, and if we find any significant difference for these variables in the two conditions, uh, we would have pointed out uh, the attentional capture effect. So in the following, we call singleton the different shape in the condition B. So in the condition A, you just have the target alone with the, the different shapes. And in the condition B, you have the target, all the, the shapes, and, uh, and a different one, the singleton. So how can we adapt it in, uh, in audition? So I will have to change uh, the, the instructions. So this time, you will hear sequences of five sounds. Uh, so be careful because they are uh, briefs, uh, they, they last like uh, one second. Uh, and the question you have to answer is just, is one of the sounds shorter or longer uh, than the others? So there is a target, it is either shorter or longer, and you just have to say uh, if it was shorter or longer. You don't have to say where it was in the sequence. So let's go for the first trial. Okay, so it's a bit complicated for the first trials, so we'll replay it. So this time the, the target was shorter, it was in the third position. We can make another trial. So maybe you have heard it. This time it was longer in the fourth position. Let's. Listen to it again. So you can hear it. It's, n it's not really about hearing the duration of the sound, but more about the, the, the rhythm and the sequence. Uh, if the, the target is shorter, it bounces a little bit. And if it's longer, it's, more, it's a bit smoother in the end. So uh, another trial. Okay, so you, you have heard it. Uh, this time the, the target was longer, but there was a different sound. I can replay it. So the, the target was in the fourth position. It was longer, but just before, in the third position, you had a different sound. And uh, so this different sound uh, is here. So this is exactly the equivalent uh, as uh, the different squares with the circle. So you have two conditions, condition A, uh, where you have the, the target alone with all the identical shapes. So here are the identical sounds. It sounds like this. And the condition B, where you have the target in the fourth position too, but uh, a different sound just before, and it sounds like that. So uh, the different sound, the single tone, had to be different. And uh, to make it different, we decided to make it brighter. Uh, so the hypothesis we, we wanted to test was that the feature brightness would mediate uh, the salient of the sounds. Um, and so to make it brighter, we just increased the spectral sense rate, which indicates where the center of mass of the spectrum is located. And the spectral sense rate is perceptually connected to the impression of brightness of a sound. And we decided to test brightness first because um, it, uh, it seemed to be an important feature in the literature of uh, saliency models. And the question was, so is there any significant difference for response times and error rates? Uh, and if so, we would have pointed out the attentional capture effect, but in addition this time. So the, the stimuli used, um, so the design was a bit long to, to make because we, we need to, we needed, we needed sorry, to, uh, to have the perfect duration so that you don't listen to the sounds one by one and you, you are still able to discriminate between the short and the long target. So finally, um, the targets were these ones, the, the last 120 milliseconds or 220 milliseconds. And the spectrum uh, was designed to, to be easily manipulated to be easily, yes, easily manipulated. So you just have, all the sounds have the same fundamental frequency and uh, every harmonic, so we, you have the 21st harmonics, every harmonic has a weight of one over n to the power alpha and we change alpha to change the, the timber. So the targets have the same timber, so alpha is equal to three, exactly. 
uh, the same and for the reference distractor. Uh, the only difference is on the duration. And so if you look uh, carefully, you see that the short target is 50 milliseconds shorter and the long target is 50 milliseconds longer. And this is the only difference uh, for the targets. And for the singleton, uh, this one has the same duration as the reference distractor, but it has a different spectrum. And we just changed the, the alpha coefficient and this gives um, different values of spectral centroid. So we can see here that the singleton uh, has a higher spectral centroid, which makes it uh, brighter, but uh, the targets are the same as the reference distractor. So the idea is that the targets have to be different on one dimension, the singleton has to be different on one other dimension, which should be independent from the first one. And we studied the, the um, how the, the manipulation on the second dimension interferes with the discrimination on the first dimension. So we conducted an experiment uh, with 15 participants running each 360 trials, uh, so with 25% of each intersection for target duration and singleton presence. And the instruction they had was the same you had, so just focus on the duration of the sounds, but we precised to them that they have to ignore all the other aspects that may vary uh, uh, in the sounds and in the timber to answer the question. Uh, this is important because uh, you may have been surprised before because you didn't know there, there would be a different sound, but the participants know there are some different sounds in the sequences sometimes, and they know them because they have 100 trials to train. So they know exactly what they have to ignore, they know what they have to listen to, and in spite of this, uh, we have significant differences for response times and error rates which means that even if they don't want to process uh, this different sound, they know how it sounds like, they, 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 are trying, they are doing all their best to ignore it, they have to process it. And it takes, uh, on average, 150 milliseconds to, to process. So the conclusion is that at equal loudness, a bright singleton among the distractors uh, captures the attention of subjects. Uh, in other words, that increasing brightness is a way to make a stimulus salient in this setting. So the, the participants uh, are forced to process, uh, to process a bright sound and the perspectives for, uh, for, for this paradigm is to be used to test less extreme values, so this is, uh, this is what I'm doing right now, uh, to test less extreme values uh, sampling the dimension by, by J and D, so just noticeable differences, and see how the effect size evolves with the different values of spectral centroid for brightness, but then we'd like to study many other parameters. The first one will be roughness. Then we would like to study the extension of these results on more complex sound scenes, so more and more complex toward the environmental, environmental sound scenes and see if the results are still valid. And if so, uh, we will be, it will be interesting to integrate these results in a salience model to guide the models towards the features important to predict the, the occurrence of salient events. And finally, uh, on these environmental sound scenes, uh, it would be interesting to correlate uh, the occurrence of these salient events to annoyance and to see if the features uh, that make a sound salient are more likely to make it annoyant too. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Thank you, Addis. Thank you. So is there any question in the in the audience? No, maybe yeah. Thank you. It's very interesting. I, I have two questions. The first one is that what's the accuracy? Because the task seems really hard. What's the average accuracy for this task? Because for me it would be zero percent. <laughs> no, it wouldn't, because you, you had no training. I mean, every participant, uh, the, the first 10 trials were completely uh, panicked and it was like, oh, it's impossible. But after uh, a few hundred trials, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm sure you will do it. So the, the error rates when you don't have the, the singleton is like uh, between, yeah, here it's 18%. Okay. So it's doable. But it, it was really important to have a task that is quite difficult so that 
people have to be very careful. They have to pay attention to what's happening and to what they're listening to, but not to complicate it so that they are better than a chance to answer. Okay, well, it's a nice paradigm. And what's the, you have a pitch contour in your sequences. Yes. Uh, is it always the same? Do you change it? How did you choose? The in fact, that there is a, a slight roving of the fundamental frequency. Uh, in fact, this was important too because we needed participants not to learn the sequences because if you cross uh, target duration and singleton presence, you only have four types of sequences. And one of the, the, the risk was that people would just uh, learn, associ associate uh, the sequence with the answer because they have a feedback, uh, uh, we tell them uh, correct or not correct. And so we wanted the sequences to be slightly different if, uh, from one trial to another. So even if you have the same uh, target duration and singleton presence or not, uh, all sequences are completely different. Okay, thank you. Thank you, do you have is there any another question? Maybe in the Zoom meeting, Simon? No? Okay. So thank you again, Baptiste. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So we'll now